Hello, everyone. I'm Adam Love, a pastor at Mayfair here in Kingsport. Hi, I'm Lisa Bryant, pastor at Madam Russell and Tate's Chapel. Hello, everyone. My name is Timothy Hankins, pastor at Oakland in Greenback, Tennessee. Great to have you all with us this morning. I want to begin our time together. We're going to pray here in just a second, but I want to begin with an announcement. This is going to be my last Bible study. I'm getting ready to have a baby. Well, I'm not getting ready to have, my wife is getting ready to have a baby <laughs> and um, I'm going to be alongside her as she has a baby. So I'm going to be entering into a season of, of, um, of parental leave. And uh, so this will be my last time together with you on this Bible study, but fear not, you're going to be in great hands because Lisa and Adam are going to continue uh, the lectionary, the narrative lectionary Bible study and you don't have to um, do anything. We're gonna keep seeing videos show up here every Wednesday at 10.30, just like you're used to uh, for all the folk at Oakland. Um, Adam and Lisa are gonna continue on with this Bible study. I think you're really gonna enjoy uh, getting to continue on this thread that we've started uh, under their guidance. And I know they're gonna be a blessing to you. So um, this is my last time with you. So I'm sorry to, uh, to miss uh, going all the way through to the end of this series but I know that you're going to finish strong with Adam and Lisa, and it has been really, really wonderful um, getting a chance to discuss these, uh, these scripture lessons with Adam and with Lisa, and I hope, um, hope that they'll continue to be a blessing to you as, um, as you continue on without me. Let us pray. Almighty God, who alone can bring into order the unruly wills and affections of sinners, grant your people grace to love what you command and desire what you promise, that among the swift and varied changes of the world, our hearts may surely there be fixed where true joys are to be found. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. 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 So today we're going to take a look at Luke chapter 19, verses 11 uh, through 28. This is a it's a difficult parable. This is not one of the ones that's easily digestible, so to speak, um, and certainly not one that gets a whole lot of attention in church, but it's important to read all the parts, right? So we're going to read this. We're going to ask some questions, and there's no good wrap-up or resolution to this. There's no way to put a nice bow on this and give you uh, one good meaning. So you're going to have to participate with us a little bit uh, you may not be here in the recording with us, but you certainly are going to have to give this some time and prayer and attention. And the one thing I want to just tell you up front, not all scripture comes to a very kind of neat resolution in our lives. Uh, we, we like to make think that it's that way. Um, we want it to be that way. We want everything to kind of translate into a good sermon series that has a really good you know, kind of three points in a poem, and this is how you apply it to your life. But life is messy. It's not always that way. And scripture is truthful, and it testifies to that. Um, and so this is one of those passages that's just, just like that. And so let's dive right into it and, uh, and see what Jesus has to say to us today starting at verse 11 of chapter 19. As they listened to this, that is, as they were listening to Jesus uh, as he concludes his time with Zacchaeus, the tax collector, as they listened to this, Jesus told them another parable because he was near Jerusalem. Now, remember, that means that as he nears Jerusalem, the mission is, is going to get fulfilled and the volume is being turned up on his teachings. And they thought God's kingdom would appear right away. Important, important line. He said, a certain man who was born into royalty went to a distant land to receive his kingdom and return. He called together 10 servants and gave each of them money with worth four months wages. He said, do business with this until I return. His citizens hated him. So they sent a representative after him who said, we don't want this man to be our king. After receiving his kingdom, he returned and called all the servants to whom he had given money to find out how much they had earned. The first servant came forward and said, your money has earned a return of 1,000%. The king replied, excellent, you are a good servant. 
because you have been faithful in a small matter, you will have authority over 10 cities. The second servant came and said, Master, your money has made a return of 500%. To this one, the king said, you will have authority over five cities. Another servant came and said, Master, here is your money. I wrapped it up in a scarf for safekeeping. I was afraid of you because you are a stern man. You withdrew what you haven't deposited and you harvest what you haven't planted. The king replied, I will judge you by the words of your own mouth, you worthless servant. You knew, did you, that I'm a stern man withholding what I didn't deposit and harvesting what I didn't plant. Why then didn't you put my money in the bank? Then when I arrived, at least I would have gotten it back with interest. So again, Luke likes to take these stories and, and pair them together. Um, and, and it's almost like it's, Luke never wants you to be totally settled, right? So you've got uh, oh, the, the story of what? The, um, um, the Good Samaritan, emphasizing God's grace, followed by the story of Mary and Martha. Uh, you've got the story of uh, the, the lost things, coin, purse, and then the prodigal son uh, paired with the story of the tenants. So there are these things that are, are quite demanding with Luke. But let's just ask some questions really quickly. Um, Lisa, when you hear this story and, mm -hmm. and you see um, Jesus or suppose, who we supposedly, you know, you may just, you may say something else, but most of us see the, the king as Jesus, right? Now, that's the way it's, it's commonly read. Demanding a return on what he's given you. Um, what do you think about that? So I look at it a little bit, I guess a little bit different, not so much as demanding a return, mm -hmm. but um, wise usage of okay. the resources. I mean, the first two um, wisely used what the king had given them mm -hmm. to multiply it. They at least tried, right? Um, right. But the third one did nothing with his, with his resources. And we're coming right um, behind, like you said, Zacchaeus, who um, uses his possessions in a, in a wise way. Yeah. Way, um, so I think it's just kind of a continuation of uh, Jesus telling his disciples to use their resources, use what he has given them while, while he's been teaching them on the way to Jerusalem. Use these things wisely. Timothy, when you hear the, this story of these these three servants. Um, and you hear lines like, um, his citizens hated him, so they sent a representative after him, right? At, and this story of a stern man who's going to demand a return on his investment from his people. Um, does this strike you uh, as, as, as something we would expect from Jesus? Well, first of all, we have a guest scholar here in Bible study. This is... <laughs> Murtaugh decided he wanted to make an appearance. He always has to make his presence known. <laughs> um, I'm not sure what his opinion on the parable is, but he is very cute. Well, I would also say, being a cat, he is he would he would identify with a stern ruler. <laughs> That's absolutely right. Definitely, definitely a stern ruler. This one. Um, so your question was how how do I square this description mm -hmm. of the ruler with our understanding of Jesus? Mm -hmm. Um, and I think, I think there's a few ways to go about um, understanding it. Um, I do think that, let me just problematize it for a second and say, I think that it's maybe not always the wisest interpretive choice to assume that a king or a ruler in one of Jesus' parables is a reflection of Jesus or God. I don't know that Jesus always intends it that way. And so there is a reading of this parable in which the stern ruler is just that, a stern ruler. Uh, and perhaps even, you know, not, uh, not completely just. Um, there's a reading of this parable in which the, the ruler represents the power of the empire, uh, the Roman empire specifically. 
Um, Jesus um, is certainly, like, if, if you move a little f- further forward in chapter 19, Jesus is certainly concerned about the future disposition of Jerusalem related to Rome. Uh, when Jesus weeps over Jerusalem, um, he's weeping over what he understands to be the outcome of um, the growing rebellious um, bent in Judea and in Jerusalem in particular against Roman rule. And he knows what the outcome of that is going to be. So there is a reading of this parable in which the, uh, the ruler is just that, a ruler, a harsh ruler. To be a little bit more maybe traditional in interpretation, you can also think about uh, this ruler as uh, representing, um, you know, the uh, Christ, the judge. You know, in the creed we say, we believe he will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. And so there is this sense um, that this return of the ruler, uh, it can be... um, thought of in terms of the final return of Jesus and the judgment of the world. And, you know, there's going to be, you know, a, an accounting for how we use the spiritual gifts that we're given. I think that's another interpretation of this parable. Um, I think we need to get all the way to the end of the parable to really, really understand how that might relate uh, to an overall interpretation of the parable. And I know we're not quite there yet. I don't want to jump the gun, Adam, because I know you're going to take us there. Um, but I think there, there's a couple of different ways to read that. Um, I, I do worry, though, sometimes if we're just so quick to put Jesus in the story as the ruler, uh, that sometimes it can lead us down interpretive paths that aren't as productive as they could be. Yeah, very good. Definitely. Very good. Yeah. Okay, so um, I think for me, if I were asking Adam, what do you think? I would say, um, or I, would, I, I am going to say, um, I, I think the first verse in the, in the parable is pretty important. Verse 11, uh, as he brought them, they were going near Jerusalem and they thought God's kingdom would appear right away. And Jesus has been pretty clear in Luke, God's kingdom is already and is to come. And he corrects people on that all the time. When they're, when they're waiting on the kingdom, he says, no, the kingdom is now. Wherever I am, there's the kingdom. And so I think that the spirit of Jesus does call us to account. And in Luke, especially, what we see is a Savior who offers grace, but then expects you to do something with it. Um, You know, we could talk about our Wesleyan understanding of cooperative grace. I I do understand, like, the the stern imagery um, is is hard, but I, you know, again, I go back to, um, oh, oh, he's got a He's a Pentecostal preacher and he's got a podcast and I, I love listening to him and I forget his name right off the top of my head, but one of the Brian things, he does, pardon? Brian Zahn? No, it's one of his disciples. It's, it's Greg one of Boyd. His, pardon? Greg Boyd? No, it's one of those. Um, he says the good news is there's going to be judgment and the bad news is there's going to be judgment. You know, <laughs> like... The, and, and I think that's the gospel. The good news is there's going to be judgment. You know, God's will and God's, God's uh, reign will be brought to bear on the sinfulness of the world. And the bad news is there's going to be judgment because we all have a stake in the sinfulness and the brokenness of the world. And God expects us to respond to grace in a way that increases grace. Um, one of the things I, I come back to with this is there's, I don't, you know, if, if Luke is talking about, you know, imagining like the very first listeners of this Jesus prior to even the Roman destruction of Jerusalem, which I know we're kind of getting in the weeds there a little bit, or if he's talking about the Lucan community of the church, these are both really poor people, both sets of people. Um, they're not going to hear this and say, oh, well, I'm, you know, I'm the one with the money. I've, I've got this to invest they're going to know that's allegorical. It's grace. So, yeah. Okay. Well, let's keep going here and get to the, to, to the well, I mean, it's not like it's not hard enough to interpret already, but now it really gets it that way. Verse 24, he said to his attendants, take this money and give it to the one who has 10 times as much, or excuse me, take his money, then talking about the one who wrapped it in a scarf and buried it in the ground. 
take his money and give it to the one who has 10 times as much. But master, they said, he already has 10 times as much. He replied, I say to you that everyone who has uh, will be given even more. But for those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for my enemies who don't want me as their king, bring them here and slaughter them before me. After Jesus said this, he continued on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. So, you know, there's the Hallmark movie ending that you were looking for in all of Jesus's uh, ministry. Um, okay, so we're getting nearer Jerusalem. The teaching is getting more and more intense. Lisa, is it easier to just end this at verse 26 or even verse 25 and just not even worry about 26, 27, and 28? Uh, that's certainly what a lot of people do when they preach or teach this story. Sure. Sure, but it's there and it, it, it's part of it. So, um, and we've talked about before that Jesus' parables are multivariant. So, you know, they can have so many different meanings. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, like you, um, like you said, the teaching gets more intense, more. Um, so, you know, there may be in this verse 27, a little bit of a shock factor here. Mm -hmm. um, because after he said this, he goes on ahead to Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's it. Um, but, you know, I, when I hear verse 26, I think about that verse in uh, chapter 11, where um, Jesus says to ask and it will be given, search and you'll find, knock and the door will find, be open for you. But then he, everyone who asks receives. And he says, if a child asks for an egg, we'll give a scorpion. If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So I feel like, um, I think this um, more that is given is when we use our resources, what we have been given, um, when we use it for kingdom building mm -hmm. activity, mm -hmm. we are given more. We're given more to use, more, more to spend, more to use. Right. Timothy, when you hear these concluding verses, would it be easier to just leave them be or, you know, just not pay attention, cut them off? Or do we have a duty to include them and, and deal with them when this, this parable is already problematic? You know, I honestly think there is a reading of these final verses in which the gospel becomes crystal clear. Okay. What is that? Let, let me, let me just, let me just kind of, I want to, I want to walk carefully through this because I want to, I want to try to draw out a point here. Um, first of all, let me say that I think Lisa's um, interpretation is good. Um, I, I do want I do want to push back a little bit on it and, and maybe just sort of like shift the focus a little bit because what I, what, what I do worry about when we talk about these passages, these verses, is I worry about people who feel like they are giving their all to Jesus and they're not receiving um, them feeling as if they're being rejected. Um, I, think, I think that's something we do need to be aware of, you know, there, that we can talk about giving, like using the grace you've been given in a way that produces more grace Think that's appropriate and good but i think we have to be careful when we talk about it that we don't cause people to lose heart because i know from experience that there are times when you feel like you are leaning into god's grace as hard as you know how to and you still feel like you're dry as a bone you still feel like there's no fruit being produced and mm -hmm. i think that happens in everyone's life i think everyone's spiritual life has these moments where it just doesn't seem like that no matter how hard that you're trying to squeeze out some fruit like the fruitfulness of the kingdom just doesn't seem to be making itself manifest in your life and for anyone watching this that feels that way i want you to know every pastor in this podcast feels that way has felt that way like we're all there 
no matter no matter what your level of spiritual attainment might be, no matter what your position in the church might be, everyone has gone through those moments when it seems like there is nothing to show for the talent, the pound, the money, whatever the metaphor is in the parable that we're talking about. There, there, there's nothing to show for what you've been given. And that's why I do think here at the end of this parable, there is in a very real sense, an incredible moment of gospel truth that we can really get our hands around and can actually give us hope. As harsh as the language is here, I think there is a word of hope in this because here's the mistake that the, that the servant given the, in, in my translation, it's the one pound. Um, in, in the other, tra the translation is right, the, the small amount of money um, and, and, and has nothing to show for it. The mistake that he makes is that he knows what kind of master he serves. And so his response to the obligation, to the responsibility that he's been given, his response is to do everything he can to protect it. In other words, he does what he knows to do in his own strength and in his own power to keep things safe and protected. That's the mistake he makes. And that's the mistake we make when we, when we make ourselves responsible for our own salvation. When we put our trust in our own abilities, we will never bear fruit. When we put our, our trust in our own um, ability to achieve righteousness, to find salvation, to attain sanctification, when we're working on that in our own strength, we might as well be burying our hands in the sand. We might as well be putting everything that we have to offer in a deep, dark hole. We might as well be doing nothing because that's what we're going to have to show for it. And so the gospel message, I think, at the end of this parable is it is the Holy Spirit that does the work within us. It's when we give ourselves up and when we give up that control when we give up that desire to be in charge of our own salvation, when we're able to relinquish that, that is when we blossom, that is when we flourish. And it's only when we hold on tight to things that we find that even what we're trying to hold on to slips out of our grasp. And I think that's something for us to really, really latch onto in this parable. I think that's the gospel moment in this story. I think that uh, both of you are right, and I, and I want to add to it one more, one more take, and that is all throughout Luke we've been been listening to Jesus, who has been you know, a couple of big you know major things in Luke, but one of them certainly is that Jesus, and this is for all the Gospels, but Luke really especially, um, there is a a difference between the written law, and the heart of the law. And Jesus calls us to the higher standard, which is the heart of the law. And that's how he makes these leaps to include um, Gentiles in the kingdom, to include uh, the enemies of, of Judaism and Roman uh, persecutors within the kingdom of God, is he looks for those who, as Paul writes uh, in his works, um, are living into God's law by their very being, because they're, they're following after the heart of the law. And I think Jesus is, again, attacking religious people here who pride themselves on following the rules, but not living into the heart of the law. And, and so, for instance, um, go back to uh, not this past Sunday, but I think the Sunday before, and if I'm not mistaken, I'm pretty sure it's in, in chapter 16. Um, yeah, chapter 16. So just before he got into the, uh, the, the par not the parable, that is a parable, uh, but the rich man and Lazarus, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees. He says, you're money lovers. And um, he says, God knows your heart. And then right before the story of, of Lazarus and the rich man, there's this one verse, this one sentence Jesus utters. And you think, what, what on earth does this have to do with any of this, but we're talking about rich people and going to heaven. And all of a sudden Jesus starts talking about divorce, really? And, and so any man, this is a uh, 16 verse 18, thrown almost, you wonder why it's there. Any man who divorces his wife, but marries another commits adultery. And the man who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. And we know that 
it was common practice uh, to follow the law, to divorce your wife, and to uh, get a new model, so to speak, you know, move on. Um, and so these faithful religious people were doing just that. They were following the letter of the law, but they weren't following the heart of the law. And I, I think that, you know, this is the same Jesus who says, wherever your heart is, you know, that's, that's where your treasure is going to be. And if your heart is within the heart of the law, within God's good purposes, then you are going to be responding to God's grace in a way that multiplies it in the world. Not Adam, back up, go ahead. Back up, to verse, back up to verse 16 in chapter yeah. uh, 16. The law and the prophets were in effect until John came. Since then, the good news of the kingdom of God is proclaimed, and everyone tries to enter it by force. But it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one stroke of a letter in the law to be dropped. Anyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. And whoever marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. I mean, this gets to your point. Like, like, like there is this like desire to turn the kingdom of God into a place where power is brokered. Yeah. And there's nothing more power brokering than the divorce uh, decree in the law of Moses, right? It's all about power and, and who wields it. And Jesus says, guess what? Even that place in Moses' law where your hearts were so hard that Moses had to make room for you to do this, this type of power mongering over, in effect, the weakest members of society, women, right? Even in that, even that is changing. Um, not that the law is passing away, but that the kingdom of God is not going to be a place where force and power are what rules the day. It's going to be a place where grace and mercy and God's love and universal acceptance of every one of God's lost children is going to matter. That's what the kingdom of God's all about. Lisa, what does that do to the end of this story? When we read, remember, I mean, like we like to, to chapters and verses and we, we chunk things up and we say, mm -hmm. here's a story and here's a story, and here's a story. But remember, you know, Luke wrote these things to be read or Luke wrote this as it did every <coughs> biblical author wrote it uh, intending for it to be read in its entirety, right? Um, so when we talk about that, does that help us with the end of this parable in chapter, uh, is it 18? Um, 19. Where we are now, I'm not seeing. Yeah. Yeah, I've been going what, back and forth. What does it do like to, are we really talking about money and power here? So Luke often does that. And, uh, you know, he, he pairs these stories or these parables together to be read together. Right. And um, so your question is, are we really talking about power? Mm -hmm. Do you, here's my question. Let me put it this way. Given what Jesus is teaching us about the heart of the law, you know, when we get to the end of this, is this really a tyrant king judging people gotcha. for not making enough money? Or in this gospel where things are reversed, is it something else in your opinion? I think it is totally something else. Yeah. I do. Um, you know, back to what you said earlier, the good news is there's judgment. The bad yeah. news is there's judgment. Um, there is judgment. And there are people who um, do not recognize Jesus as their king. Yeah. Um, Isn't it amazing that the people who I think perhaps might have the hardest time recognizing Jesus as their king or one. A lot of them are the religious people who mm -hmm. were just really misled, you know, who, who, who think that God gives law so that there can be kind of a, a certain strata of power, power mongering. Um, and they find it going back to verse 11, they're looking for the kingdom to come and they all the time forget that they're already in the kingdom. That are already here. Yeah. And and that that um, 
that Jesus gives this law that kind of um, separates us Mm -hmm. into categories um, or into, you know, and, and, and that nothing could be farther from the truth. It is a leveling Mm -hmm. of all of us Mm -hmm. rather than a a power or a, a, a structure completely leveling. Yeah. I want to, uh, we'll close here with this, but, uh, and, and Lisa appropriately is going to close us in prayer because, you know, we're, we're getting closer and closer to Jerusalem and um, judgment is coming. And the very, you know, we may not understand it this way, but the very first, uh, you know, iteration of judgment is Jesus on the cross and then Jesus returning in glory and resurrection. And of course, in Luke's gospel, when we get to chapter 24, the Easter story in Luke, which is where we're all headed, um, uh, the, the men are not there. The powerless people are there. The women are there. And they are the very first preachers of the gospel. And Luke actually names them. Here are these women who go to the tomb and they run back to the men. And what do the men think? They're, they're foolish. They're just talking, you know, th- these are just women talking and they're, and they're giving into their kind of their, their hearts and not thinking with their heads. And uh, in Luke says it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles, which is by the way, where they, they, especially Mary Magdalene gets the title of apostle to the apostles. Their words struck the apostles as nonsense, and they didn't believe the women. But the women were right. And so I think it's a real mistake to read this story and think that, oh, look, Jesus is re-emphasizing our power structure. And the people who can earn the most and have the most, well, they're the people who are loved the most. And how silly it would be to read that this parable that way, especially after the rich man and Lazarus, right? Jesus is talking about a different kind of power. I think that this, this has to be like the, the, the reality of, of how Luke structures his gospel. And, and Murtaugh's back and he's got thoughts on this, but yeah. <laughs> the, the reality of how, of how Luke structures his gospel is that the very structure of Luke's gospel undercuts traditional power structures. Yep. It just does. Mm-hmm. And we have to, I mean, from the beginning to the end, because it starts with a teenage girl in the backwaters of Judea, right? Yeah. And it ends with Mary Magdalene at the tomb. Um, so like from the from beginning to end, he's doing something different, right? Yeah. And, and, and so we have to put this parable into, into that context. It's very, very important. And so we cannot allow ourselves to read verse 27 as some sort of gleeful power play against God's enemies, right? Yeah. You cannot read this against the cross and put them in juxtaposition to each other. You simply cannot. They have to be harmonized. And the only way to harmonize them is that the way God kills God's enemies is by embracing them and making them not God's enemies anymore. Yeah. I know we said we're going to wrap up, but I want to ask this question of each of you. Then, Lisa, I want I want Lisa to pray for us and wrap us up. But um, a lot of abuse has been done, especially with things as despicable as the prosperity gospel. Mm-hmm. Um, with um, especially with verse twenty four, you know, where where the, the the king or the ruler says to his attendants, "Take the money away from the one who doesn't have any, and give it to the one who's already got ten times as much." And then the servants even say, "Master, he already has ten times as much." But he says, "I'll take from those who don't have and give to those who do." And I'll never, you know, like I I never thought many people read it that way. Not even enough to really be worried about. But um, a lot of people do. A lot of people do read it that way. Unfortunately. And I remember a couple of years ago now, I'm sitting in my car flipping through the radio stations um, and, and, and up pops um, a very famous, longtime, well-known preacher from Atlanta, from a big Baptist church down there. We'll, we'll leave it there. Um, 
not the younger one, but the older one who's been around for a really long time. Um, not that I'm going to name names, but uh, he's, he said exactly the same thing. Poor people are poor because they choose to be poor because they're not responsible and God takes the wealth and gives it to those who have the most. I don't know of a more unfaithful reading of Luke. Do you? No. I mean, if you take those, what, two or three sentences yeah. and take them completely and totally out of the Bible, that's the only way you could justify that. Yeah. To read that that way. The entire Bible, God has cares for the poor. Yeah. The orphan, the widow. Luke. In his gospel, all about the poor and what the wealth, the wealthy do with helping the poor and with their wealth. Yeah. You cannot read that and you just can't. I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 Unless that's all you read. Well, I, I think it's weak, you know, I think it's the very essence of the one who buries the money in the scarf to only read those few verses that they want. I, that's how I would turn that back, yeah. Timothy, do you have anything to say about that? Oh, I've got things to say. <laughs> can, can, can you, you've got, you've got a minute and a half to say what you wanna say about that. No, very simply, like, you know, a lot of the evangelical cottage industry of condemning the poor for being poor um, has absolutely nothing that can be in consonance with the Bible, period. It just, it's just not possible. Um, does God bless us? Yes, God absolutely blesses us. Um, do we sometimes make irresponsible decisions? Oh, absolutely, no doubt about it. Does, does all of that have some sort of like um, almost predestinatory uh, impact on the way that we're related to God? No, not even a little bit. Um, you know, I think, again, I'll go back to the prayer of general thanksgiving. Um, we give you thanks for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but most especially for the redemption of the world through our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. I think that's the appropriate attitude of Christians toward their blessings, toward their possessions, toward the wealth uh, that, that, some, that some are blessed with. It should always be couched within this general air of thanksgiving, which is the Christian attitude toward the world. Thanksgiving for the creation of the world, thanksgiving for the preservation of the world, the preservation of ourselves, uh, thanksgiving for all of the blessings that we receive throughout life, but most especially that God has redeemed and made new this creation through the gift of his son, Jesus Christ, has given us the means of grace and the hope of a future glory in which all of the present sorrows will be redeemed. And the end of that prayer is, and make us such aware, make us so aware of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts, we may offer up ourselves to your service, showing forth our thanksgiving, not just with our lips, but in our lives. Um, that, that is how you get around this absolutely ludicrous attitude that you see evidenced in um, the, the preacher that you referenced, Adam, and in countless others, uh, some mm -hmm. of whom have nationally syndicated radio programs. Um, the, the reality and is, what, what's that saying? And and yeah, the, the reality simply is that God blesses us, um, but that has nothing to do with any special relationship we have with God. Um, and it's not because our faith is so much better than anyone else's or our disposition towards the Lord is any greater. Um, and our only response to the blessings that we enjoy must always be thanksgiving and thanksgiving that shows forth itself in our lives, living our lives in a way that embodies thanksgiving. We also might remember that this is the same gospel writer who talks about how the apostles brought all their possessions and, and, and the people brought their possessions and laid them at the feet of the apostles um, so that no one in their community would go without 
and and maybe maybe that's the correct interpretation of this of this parable is that the 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 ones who drew the most and i think that we've said this 50 times over already today and we've gone on for a long time and if you're still with us kudos you get a yeah <laughs> you get a special uh, your your uh limited edition coffee mug um something like that but um that the return on the investment is is not the wealth of the king, but maybe it is the wealth of King Jesus because he shares his wealth with the community we call the church and with all of creation. And with that, Lisa, please close us. In I actually kind of one little one more little thing. We um, knew it was coming, ladies and gentlemen. One more thing. One more little thing. Just as listening to Timothy and you talk, I mean. We, do the disciples think that the eschaton mm -hmm. is is coming when they get to Jerusalem? The end is near, right? Mm -hmm. um, the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. What is the kingdom of God except for this leveling of um, you know? It's a you know there won't be wealthy or poor when the kingdom of God is culminated, is fulfilled. Um, it will all be the same. Mm -hmm. We'll all be the same. Mm -hmm. So yeah, could there be that um, Jesus is telling them to work towards that, to, mm -hmm. to um, mm -hmm. you know, help bring that about? Amen. So, okay. Yeah. With that, I will close with prayer. Most gracious heavenly father, we do give you thanks for the many blessings that you have poured out on each and every one of us. And we give you thanks for your creation, for the preservation and redemption of your creation through Jesus Christ. And we ask that you may fill our hearts, may double our portion of grace that we might be kingdom builders in our own parts of your creation that we might bring about your kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. We'll see you later. Bye. Prayers Bye, for, our, uh, for our friend and our brother Timothy. And yes. Kristen, as you, you turn this chapter into parenthood. So this God time next you. week, this time next week, we'll have, a, we'll have a baby boy. All right. <laughs> Yay. God bless you all. Bye-bye. Bye. God bless you. Bye-bye.